good Tuesday morning to you, and thanks so much for being with us here on Court TV Live. I'm your host, Julie Grant. We kick off this hour in Idaho with what could be a pivotal point in the murder trial of Lori Vallow Daybell as a key piece of DNA evidence is revealed during Monday's testimony. And this piece of evidence could tie her directly to the murders of her children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. Now, Colt Mom is also charged with conspiring to kill her husband, Chad Daybell's previous wife, Tammy. A medical examiner is due back on the stand this morning for some cross-examination. All this, as we're being told, the state could rest its case this week. Now, let's take you live to Boise, Idaho, where Court TV anchor Ted Rollins is standing by for us outside of the courthouse in Ada County. Ted, good morning to you. Great to see you. Uh, let's talk about the DNA evidence, if we can, please. Yeah, this was a bombshell in, in the courtroom yesterday. Julie, good morning to you. Kaylee Coleman, well, a DNA analyst, was on the stand. And we had heard, remember, about this hair that was found in duct tape, so basically caught in the adhesive at the bottom of a piece of duct tape that was part of that never-ending winding of duct tape around J.J. Vallow's body. And they tested it, and she went through the testing procedure, who they were looking at in terms of known samples, and boom, uh, she delivered it for the jury that the hair found on the inside of the duct tape that was part of the wrapping of J.J. Vallow belonged to the defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell. In May of 2022, I received three DNA profiles. Um, these were from Lori Vallow Daybell, Ty Lee Ryan, and Melanie Gibb. I also received several items of evidence, one of which was processed as Bodhi E01, which was a hair attached to a piece of adhesive. What results were obtained from your analysis? So from the uh, Bodhi item E01, which was the hair sample, a partial female profile was obtained. And were you able to make any conclusions based on those results? Yes. Tylee Ryan and Melanie Gibb were excluded as, potential, as possible contributors of that partial DNA profile. Um, the partial DNA profile matched the DNA profile that was provided for Lori Vallow Dayville. Okay. Did you perform any statistics for the match? Yes, I did. The probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with that partial DNA profile is 1 in 71 billion. Yeah, you heard uh, Larry Woodcock outside the courthouse. You played that clip earlier. He said this is the nail in the coffin. And for jurors, Julie, you know this, this is huge because now it's physical evidence tying the defendant to a murder. I will say this, this is the mother, and he's wearing those red PJs. Could the mother's hair have transferred? Obviously. So, waiting on cross-examination for that line of questioning from the defense, but true to uh, what they've done so far in this case, didn't go down that road. Shocking. I mean, this was an easy one for the defense to come back with to try to get this expert on the record saying that, yes, a mother's hair could be found uh, in a situation like this. Didn't do it, so huge win for the state of Idaho. Oh, it certainly is. Uh, great points there, Ted. Uh, I sure hope they're gonna hit that home in closing arguments, uh, as they should, uh, because um, as you know, nothing is clear cut, right? There's two sides to everything. And uh, sure, prosecutors see this as an enormous link that could really change this trial. Uh, but if you're you know, a good defense attorney, you are gonna challenge that and say, look, you know, she's his mother, of course. It, it wouldn't be stunning for her DNA to be on his body, on his clothing. Uh, excellent point, Ted. Uh, Ted, could we talk a little bit about Tammy Daybell, her autopsy? You know, because there's been such a cloud of mystery around this, how she died, all of that. Understand, uh, largely Monday, the Emmy uh, addressed many things. Uh, tell us, please, uh, what was said about her autopsy, if you would. Yeah, this is something that we thought the state was going to have to clear up, and boy, they sure have. Uh, they've started that process. The ME will be back on the stand today when court is, uh, resumes. His name is Eric Christensen. He's the chief medical examiner uh, in, in the county, and, and he basically went through Tammy's cause of death and his opinion after exhuming the body. Remember, there was no original autopsy here, but when suspicions started to grow, they exhumed her body, and he noted the bruising 
found on her arms, on her chest, and then about that pink foam. And this would resonate with the jury because they saw a photo of Pam, uh, Tammy with this pink foam coming out of her mouth. And he said that it was consistent with asphyxiation. And that is how he believes she died. And if you believe this medical examiner, well, the guy laying right next to her is Chad Daybell. And one would make that connection, one would think. Uh, he'll be back on the stand when court resumes here uh, in just a bit. Stuff, uh, as you know, uh, Ted Rollins, what a treat it is to have you reporting on this show as you're anchoring your show from Idaho all this week. Everybody needs to tune in for that. We'll talk more in the next hour, talk more about that DNA evidence and how this may be uh, changing the game in this case. Ted, thanks very much. You bet. Oh, now, my courties, we want to take a minute on this show to talk a little more about that duct tape and the DNA evidence that Ted was just telling about and how this could be tipping the scales of justice, as I like to say, against cult mom Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, to help me break this all down, I'm going to bring in two great guests standing by in Nashville, Tennessee, retired police sergeant with the Nashville Police Department, Melissa Pinkleton, is with us, and in Jacksonville, Alabama, forensic death investigator, the host of the Body Bags podcast and professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan, with us as well. Good morning to you both. Let's talk a little bit, just first initial reactions you had in hearing this evidence that many of us believe is bombshell evidence against cult mom. Professor Joe, I want to start with you, please. Hey, yeah, good morning, Julie. Thanks for having me. I was absolutely amazed when I got this news about the hair, and this is why. Um, you're talking about putting, putting a, a, a biological element of Lori Vallow adjacent to not just a piece of tape, Julie, but a murder weapon. Remember, they're talking about, uh, you know, JJ's death is as a result of being taped up and asphyxiated. Uh, this this is a this is a modality of death. It's not like just some kind of arbitrary thing that they have found here. This this tape was used as a utility to bring about his death. This is not just simply him being bound. This is not just wrapping the body. This is actually a murder weapon. That's what makes this so incredibly profound. Uh, Professor Joe, love what you just said. There, a modality of death. I mean, think about it, you know, the pajamas, it could be on the, you know, pajama pants, could be on the little boy socks, you know, you could see that happening. But as you said, there's a very distinct place this was on. Uh, that, that weapon, I love it, how you put it, Professor. Uh, this is exactly why we wanted to pick your brain about this. Uh, Sergeant Pinkleton, uh, the law enforcement aspect of this, what does this piece of evidence do for those investigators who are working this case? This piece of evidence gives not 100% confirmation, but it's just another element of stepping the case against her that her DNA is on the duct tape, like Joseph said, as a weapon that was used to kill her own child. And I was waiting for the cross-examination. The first thing that popped in my head was everybody is like, oh, they're going to say it was in her house. She has long hair and it, it probably got stuck on there and transferred. And I find it so interesting they didn't go there because I, I think the jury was probably, if I'm sitting on the jury, I'm waiting to hear that. And when I don't hear that, that even crushes it, that, that even sends the message home even more that, wow, maybe she really is completely guilty and their reasonable doubt is just going amping up and amping up. But from an investigation standpoint, it's huge. It's, it, it is one of the top pieces of evidence. Uh, DNA is always the holy grail CSI effect evidence that the jurors want. And so I, I think that it's going to make the impact that it's supposed to make. Oh, definitely, Sergeant. Uh, if I was that prosecutor, I'd be waving that piece of duct tape around all throughout my closing argument. I'd get as close to her at council table as I could, put it in front of her face, uh, get her to look at it. We know she's turned away when there's been a lot of upsetting images. Uh, whoo, uh, this, is, this is big. Okay, I, I want to pick your brains about something else, too. Tammy Daybell. Uh, so mysterious, the way in which she died and then the family like seemed to not bat an eyelash at the time and sort of accept it as normal uh, and um, you know Tylee Ryan you know I, her her location uh, another thing that's really really bizarre about this is 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 how and when Tylee got to the Daybell 
property, how she disappeared and JJ was it all at the same time. So I want to play some clips for you both. Uh, now, from, from the hearing, we like to highlight the best pieces of the testimony every morning on this show. Uh, let's start with Ty Lee. Uh, in, in her last known location and see what this tells us. This is from Ricky Wright. He is an FBI investigator. Take a listen. The vehicle arrives back at 565 Pioneer Road, number 175. The residence for uh, Lori Vallow at 2037 or 837 p.m. And based on what you reviewed with this data, did you come to a conclusion with regard to Tylee Ryan? Uh, yes, so the initial information about us conducting additional information, uh, investigation at Yellowstone, um, I couldn't identify uh, much of any in uh, points to investigate there other than potentially along the route traveled. Um, and, uh, and that based on the photograph and her last known proof of life that she had uh, my, I had confidence that she had returned to this address at 8.37 p.m. And now that was our new, our new point in our timeline that we needed to scrutinize our last known location for her. The last known location for that child. How sad is that, Professor Joe, that they're using the box in the vehicle to try to figure out when that child was last seen because her mother is no help to law enforcement. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, it is very difficult, and and not and not just that. And I, I don't want to wax too gruesome here, but here here's the problem: when you look at the state of uh, of Tylee's remains, uh, it, it's really hard for those of us in forensics to try to frame that. Uh, you know, because people want exact times in these things. We we can kind of bracket it and give you. Uh, give you a range of times relative to the state of the body and everything and and but you know the last time she was known alive and we've seen those you know those photos from them at at Yellowstone you know where uh, her and her brother are embracing there's that infamous picture of Alex kind of lurking in the background there a very ominous kind of kind of uh, thread that runs through this and that's that's really all that we know you know, of her, and she just kind of vanishes at this point. JJ is a bit easier, you know, to tie back from, you know, an investigative standpoint and certainly from uh, a, an evidentiary forensic standpoint. But Tylee, you know, it, it will remain a mystery, I think, uh, when we talk about the very specifics of when she passed on. Great points, Professor Joe. Uh, and if we could turn to Tammy Daybell, because I want to ask you both, you know, about her. Uh, let's play a little clip from the court hearing uh, on Monday. Dr. Eric Christensen, who did the autopsy on her, uh, and talking about his estimate at the time of death. And based on what was reported to you, do you, when would you estimate a time of death if you can? Um, so I guess I'll, I'll phrase this in a couple of ways. Um, the presence of rigor mortis, again, as I said, it will generally uh, begin relatively quickly after death, you know, within an hour or two, um, and uh, becomes more and more pronounced for several hours, um, and then will persist until decomposition ensues. Uh, so a, you know, finding a body that's described as stiff uh, is consistent with the person having been dead for at least an hour or two, but could be much longer. So if Tammy was reported as cold and stiff at 6 a.m., you would estimate her to have been dead for a couple hours at that point, at least? In that ballpark, yes. You wouldn't estimate her death to have been closer in time, such as 5.30, 5.40 a.m.? No. All right, we know Mr. Doomsday was sleeping next to her uh, in the bed, uh, based on what we've heard through the testimony. Sergeant Pinkleton, as somebody who's worked homicides, many of them, in your years of service, we thank you for that. Um, what do you think about these facts, the fact that uh, she'd been dead for a while before anybody called for help? Well, I think it's obviously very, very damaging because it completely flies in the face of his account of events and his story. And, you know, that... And, the medical examiner is correct. For her body to have been stiff and cold, it had to have been several hours. You know, I've been on the scene of many um, DOAs, dead bodies, and the 
him lying right next to her, maybe he's a super heavy sleeper. Maybe I can give him that benefit of the doubt, but I don't really think that that's the case. And I think just even more damaging is going to be what they have to what the um, what they had found during her autopsy, which was uh, the, all the damage to her body and ruling it a homicide now. And so that's much more damaging as well. Exactly, Sergeant. She had the bruising on her arms, on her chest, consistent with somebody who was restrained or asphyxiated. Uh, Sergeant Pinkleton, Professor Joseph Scott Morgan, stand by, please. More questions coming your way in just a moment. We have to hit a break now. When we come back, I'm going to answer a question that many of you have been asking me on social media, and that is, will cult mom face the death penalty if she's convicted? The answer is no. Absolutely not. And it's not because she's not eligible. She is eligible by law. It's because the prosecutors made a costly mistake. And they are being penalized now. We'll explain when we come back. The mystery that's captivated the nation. This stretch is just so beyond what anyone could imagine. And left a trail of dead bodies. Lori Vallow Daybell, accused of triple murder, including her two youngest children. You'll hear every dramatic moment. Money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. Just tell the truth. It's that simple. The Doomsday Cult Mom Murder Trial. Coverage continues today, only on Ford TV. The vast majority of the times when I perform an autopsy, uh, I get an entire body, and there's a very, there's a process that we went through, like with JJ, that I go through. Tylee's case was different. Tylee's remains were received in three separate sealed bags. JJ was found with a plastic bag over his head that was duct taped tightly. He was bound. There was evidence of a struggle, and there's no other explanation of why he was dead. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm your host, Julie Grant. Thank you for being with us on this Tuesday morning. Let's talk a little now about the doomsday cult mom and capital punishment, something that in our justice system in America is reserved for the worst of the worst. Here, Lori Vallow Daybell is accused of conspiring to kill two of her children and the previous wife of her now husband, and also co-defendant, by the way, even though their cases were severed. The facts are brutal. We know that. These facts are so egregious that by law in the state of Idaho, where she's being tried, she is death penalty eligible upon a criminal conviction. Well, she was, that is. That was until the prosecution made a colossal error, a mistake so appalling that they were actually sanctioned for it by the judge. That is why the death penalty has been taken off the table in this case. That was once a capital case, a case where the prosecutors were seeking the death penalty and the other side had notice of that. And now we've got some big consequences for that terrible error. Let's take a listen together to the part of the hearing where Judge Stephen Boyce, the trial judge presiding over this case, penalizes the prosecutors. At the outset, this court has considered the arguments in the motion to dismiss the death penalty relating to media saturation, the defendant's mental health, and the ability or inability of the state of Idaho to currently carry out a death sentence. The court notes that also under advisement are motions challenging the constitutionality of Idaho's death penalty statute. Those arguments will be addressed subsequent to the court's analysis of the argument that late disclosed discovery in this case merits a sanction of the dismissal of the death penalty and this decision will focus on that argument. It was the late disclosure of discovery. So what does that mean? Okay. Everything that is discoverable is evidence that needs to be turned over to the other side. Evidence that they get in any case. As soon as the prosecution gets it, you can't sit on it. It's like a hot potato. You just have to get rid of it. As soon as it comes to you and you learn new information, new pieces of evidence, discovery can be a whole bunch of different things. You know, it could be a crime lab report. Uh, you know, it could be a new information from a witness. You know, it could be lots and lots of things. Things police uncover, new facts. As soon as you learn them in a criminal 
criminal case when you were the state, you have a legal obligation to turn it over to the other side immediately. And the state had a deadline in this case of February 27th. The judge gave them a deadline. Everything's got to be turned over to the other side. Remember, this is a capital case. The defense is trying to save her life at this point. And if they don't have the materials to review about the case and enough time to do that, that's not fair. That doesn't ensure a right to a free, a, 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 a right to a fair trial, excuse me. You know, everybody's entitled to a right to a fair trial in the United States of America. Cult mom is cloaked in the presumption of innocence. And did the prosecution not have enough time? Well, let's think about this. JJ and Tylee and Tammy Dabo were all killed back in 2019. And that hearing where we just heard the clip from the judge was in March. They had all that time to turn over what they had. They didn't follow the rules. That is what this is all about, not following the rules. Boy, oh boy, if you ask me, this is downright disgraceful. And the defense, what a big win this was for them. I mean, cult mom should uh, thank those prosecutors for giving her such a gift uh, because of, of what they exhibited. I, I, I don't know if it was ineptitude, what it was, who knows. Uh, but the fact that they couldn't follow the rules, you know, resulted in the death penalty being off the table for cult mom. Joining me now, an attorney who has tried death penalty cases. He is also a law professor, Don Malarsik, joining us from Akron, Ohio, where he practices. Uh, Don, good to see you as always. Uh, please, your reaction to what happened in this case. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It was a travesty. You know, you said, Julie, correctly, that the death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst. I would say if you're a prosecutor and you raise your hand and you say, I'm going to make this case a death penalty case, then you better be sure that your case is the best of the best. And what that means is you're going to follow the rules. When you raise your hand and you say, I'm going to seek the death penalty, then you have to follow the rules and not only follow the rules, but be prepared for the kind of scrutiny and accountability that comes at the most important type of case that a prosecutor could possibly bring in the United States. And it's quite simply, the prosecutors in this case failed. They failed miserably. These rules that you talked about, Julia, about timely disclosure of discovery of reports, those rules apply in shoplifting cases. So these prosecutors know that they have an ethical, a legal, and a moral obligation to turn over this evidence, and they failed miserably. And now they are held accountable by this judge justifiably and, and properly. You're exactly right, Don. It, it, it's applicable in every single case. I, I am just, I, I'm baffled what it was. Incompetence, laziness, who knows? I mean, but the whole world is watching and they're aware of that. They didn't want cameras in the courtroom. So they're very aware of how high profile this case is. Uh, it's astounding to me. And, and the defense team, uh, could I talk to you please about that, Don? What a win this is for them, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, please, but when you have a capital case, isn't the number one goal to save your client's life? And here they've already done that. It is 95% of your job as a criminal defense attorney in every capital case, the beginning, the middle, and the end of everything you do from investigation to motion practice to witness preparation to themes and theories is designed to save your client's life. And you're absolutely right. This was a gift. It was well-earned. Um, they fought, they filed the motions, they argued effectively, passionately, and aggressively, and they won the motion, and I think the judge got it right. You can't have a fair proceedings if one side refuses to play by the rules. Don Malarsik, so glad you are on the show this morning. Thank you for all that. Stand by, please. Court TV has boots on the ground in Idaho, and we're going to update you every hour on this case, and we're also